So in this video, we're going to do a worked example of how to calculate the bending moment diagram for an indeterminate beam. We're given a description of the beam that it's 8 meters long, but it has a support 3 meters from the left hand side as well as supports at the left and right hand sides. We're told that the beam will be designed for an area of the building that is where people may congregate and susceptible to overcrowding. So what this means is when looking through the design standards, we can find out that we have to design for a live load of five kilonewtons per meter squared. We're also told that we have a tributary width of four meters, i.e. we have a beam every four meters. And finally, one last thing, it was were given the beam cross-sectional details, and we're told that the top bit, which is 250 millimeters by 300 millimeters, is concrete. And so that will have a stiffness of around 30 GPA. And then we have a plate on the bottom, which is made of steel. And this will have a stiffness of 200 GPA. So as we only have the dimensions to work with, we will have to calculate the second moment of area ourselves. And we will also have to work out the loading ourselves, including the south weight of the beam, which cannot be neglected. So this video will be a long video in the description. I will post up links to the different parts of this solution process. So the first thing we're going to do is determine the loading that we have on this beam. So we're told we have a live load, which is five kilonewtons per meter squared and we have a tributary width of four meters and also we have a dead load that will come from the beam itself so first of all let's calculate the dead load first of all loading the dead load so the first thing we need to know is what are the mass densities of the constituents of this beam. So we know the mass density of concrete is equal to 2,400 kilograms per meter, meter cubed. We know that the mass density of steel is equal to 7,000 840 kilograms per meter cubed and we're going to use this then to calculate our dead load in the design standards we call the dead load g so to get at our loading we'll first consider the proportion of the load dead loading coming from the concrete so we have the mass density which is 2400 and that's kilograms per meter cubed because that's eventually that will be a kilogram per meter along the beam but that's in mass so we need to multiply by gravity so 9.81 meters per second and then we're going to multiply by the cross-sectional area of concrete so that will be 250 millimeters by 300 millimeters to give us the, the dead load per meter moving along the direction of the beam. So we multiply by 0 0.3 meters, multiply by 0 0.25 meters. Then we need to add the contribution coming from the steel plate at the bottom of the beam. So we have the mass density 7,840 kilograms per meter cubed multiplied by gravity 9.81 meters per second and multiplied by the cross axle area so we have a thickness of 0.01 meter and multiplied by a width of 0.25 meters and we can add those two together and we will get that our dead load g is 1.96 kilonewtons per meter 
And when we mean by per meter, we mean per meter moving in the direction of the beam. We can now move on to the live loading. So the live loading in the standard is called Q. And we're told we have five kilonewtons per meter squared. And we have a tributary width of four meters. And therefore our live loading is 20 kilonewtons per meter along the beam. So the total loading, if we consider the ultimate limit state, at the ultimate limit state, we will consider the total loading to be 1.2 times the dead load G plus 1.5 multiplied by the live load Q. So that is equal to 1.2 multiplied by 1.96 and then we have the 1.5 multiplied by 20 so we have a total load of 32.4 kilonewtons per meter along the length of the beam we'll next go on to consider the beam's flexural rigidity In this case, we've only been given the dimensions of the beam. Let's quickly sketch that. And we have a steel plate along the bottom. And we have the dimensions. So this is 250 in millimeters, 300 in millimeters, and 10 millimeters. So the first thing that we're going to need to do is calculate the modular ratio. So the modular ratio N is equal to the Young's modulus of steel divided by the Young's modulus of concrete, which is 200 over 30. So that's equal to 6.67. And therefore, from this modular ratio, we can calculate the effective width of the steel. So we have 6.67 multiplied by the original width of the steel. So that's going to be equal to 1,668 millimeters. So when we analyze this, we're effectively considering a concrete beam that's made out of steel, made out of concrete but it has a very large or very wide piece of concrete at the bottom rather than the thin, the piece of steel that we can previously considered. Okay, now what we need to do next is work out where our centroid will be. So if it was just a square piece, that would be nicely in the middle, but we now need to consider the piece on the bottom, the equivalent. So we're gonna measure down from the top, and we need to work out where this centroid Y bar will happen to be. So Y bar is equal to, so Y bar is equal to the sum of the areas of the two pieces. We're going to consider two rectangles, rectangle one and rectangle two. That has uh, this will have y bar 1 to its centroid and the wide piece at the bottom going halfway along the, the thickness will have a y bar 2 so the y bar overall the centroid overall will equal to the summation of area 1 
or the areas multiplied by the lever arms and then divided by the total area so we can calculate that so we have 250 multiplied by 300 is the area of the original bit of concrete and the centroid down to that is 150 millimeters plus we have an area of the wide piece of concrete at the bottom which is 1668 millimeters multiplied by the 10 millimeter thickness and the lever arm or the centroid from the top of the beam is 305 millimeters and then we divide by the total area which equals 250 multiplied by 300 plus 1668 multiplied by 10 calculate that all through and the centroid of our composite section is 178 millimeters from the top so the centroid of the square was 150 so the overall centroid is just a little bit further than down where I sketched it so it's round about here and armed with that we can now calculate the beam's second moment of area where we need to use the parallel axis theorem so remember so the parallel axis theorem and this is from strength of materials and this was that the second moment of area of the total compound section is equal to the I value of a piece of the compound section we're considering plus the area of the piece of section we're considering multiplied by the distance away from the the distance of the neutral axes of that area to the neutral axes of the overall section so let's sketch that quickly so if we have our beam section and this is really wide so i'm not going to try and draw it all we've determined that we have a centroid 178 millimeters if i consider this top rectangular portion of the section we know that the centroid here would be 150 millimeters down because the overall depth is 300 so to halfway and so this distance here is what we're calling the distance between the two centroids for this rectangular section we can also remember with i equals b d cubed upon 12 where we have the width is b or breadth and the height or depth is d so don't get confused we're kind of using d twice the one is d for the rectangle one is d for the distance between the two just awkward notation so let's go on to calculate our composite second moment of area and so we have i equals 250 multiplied by 300 cubed all divided by 12 and then we need the offset so we have the total area 250 multiplied by 300 multiplied by this little offset d and that will be 178 minus 150 we have 28 millimeters offset 
and that value gets squared. So this is for this top rectangular section and now we're going to calculate the proportion from this bottom section equivalent concrete from what was originally the steel plate. So we add so we have one six six eight multiplied by 10 millimeters that will be cubed all divided by 12 so BD cubed upon 12 for rectangular plus now the little bit for the offset so we have total area of one six six eight multiplied by 10 and that will get millimeter squared multiply by the offset so we have 305 the depth down to the neutral axis of this rectangle minus the gap to the centroid of the total section that was 178 and that is squared and we calculate that through and we get that the the second moment of area for our section is 890 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the four and we can calculate our beams structural so flexural rigidity so flexural rigidity e i so that now is equal to the stiffness of concrete e and that's 30 kilonewtons per millimeter squared multiplied by 890 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the 4. And we get then that our EI value is 26,700 kilonewton meter squared. So with our loads now calculated and our flexural rigidity now calculated, we can return back to the original structure and use virtual work to determine one of the redundant reactions. So we return to our original situation. So paste. And we'll add the bits of data that we now know. We now know that this is 32.4 kilonewtons per meter. And we know the properties of the beam. The EI equals 26,700 kilonewton meters squared. As this is a redundant structure, we're going to remove one of the supports. We're going to identify a primary structure and a redundant structure and then use compatibility to calculate our redundant support reaction. So first of all, we need to identify a primary structure. So in this case, I'm going to consider my reaction at B to be my redundant support. So my primary structure then becomes, so this is A, this is C. I still have my pin support at A and my roller support at C. And a UDL, the real loading of 32.4 kilonewton meters kilonewtons per meter loading on there and then my redundant structure where I'm going to calculate my flexibility coefficient from is exactly the same geometry exactly the same support conditions as my primary structure so i have the pin support 
the left hand side, roller support at the right hand side. But now I wish to work out my flexibility coefficient three meters from the left hand side at point B. So I'm going to apply a unit load at this point so that I can eventually through using the compatibility equation calculate the reaction RBY. So the primary structure I will use to calculate the deflection delta B that occurs in the primary structure that doesn't occur in the real structure and I will use the redundant structure where I get the deformation to a unit load which is flexibility or delta B B dash which then gets me my flexibility coefficient at this point. So from the primary structure I will be calculating just to remind ourselves the formula that we can use we have that the deflection one dot deflection strictly speaking is equal to the integral between naught and L of little m capital M of E I D X. So from the primary structure I can calculate capital M. From the redundant structure I can calculate my little m and maybe it will be functions of x. So first off let's get our bending moment function m of x and we draw as usual free body diagram of the system we're looking at I'll call this W for now even though I have a number but makes life a little bit easier and we have R A Y I'll call that dash because it's in the primary structure and we will have the bending moment holding this in equilibrium M of X so let's write down the equilibrium in rotation so we have m of x plus w times x so just remind ourselves that's the distance x and the lever arm to that will be x upon 2 and the reaction r a y will be equal to the load, the total load on the structure divided by 2 and that will be acting at a lever arm of x. And we can tidy this up. So m of x is equal to w l x upon 2 minus w x squared upon 2 which equals Wx upon 2 into L minus X. Now we can calculate the bending moment function from our unit load. So we're applying a unit load in the downwards direction. So M of X for this we need to do a little bit of extra work to calculate our reactions so to calculate our reactions we need the free body diagram of the entire structure so first of all reactions so we have let's, no we have nothing in the x direction we have r a y r c y and the unit load at this point and finally just finish this off with some dimensions so we had three meters and five meters to this point and to calculate our reactions let's take a moment about a and so we have going in an anti, so in a clockwise direction, we have 
the unit load multiplied by the lever arm of three meters going anti-clockwise let's call that negative going in uh, anti-clockwise direction we have the reaction RCY multiplied by the lever arm of eight meters and that must be equal to zero for equilibrium and therefore we can find out that RCY equals plus three upon three upon eight which is 0 0.375 kilonewtons and plus because it's going in the upwards direction as we'd assumed now we'll use the sum of the forces in the y direction so we have r a y plus r c y must be equal to the unit load pointing downwards and therefore we get that our reaction r a y is equal to 0 0.625 kilonewtons now we have the reactions we can write our moment equations so again draw your free body diagram you'll have r a y and little m of x and your distance x for the first portion of the beam and r a y was not was 0 0.625 so your little m of x equals 0 0.625 multiplied by x for when x is between 0 and 3 meters and for the second part of the beam you could go from the right hand side before making your cut and you would have R C Y and M of X. And so your bending moment M of X becomes 0 0.375 and then 8 minus X if you measure your X all the way from the left hand side to keep your sign convention nice and neat and so this is applicable between where x is greater than three meters and all the way to the end of the beam at eight meters so now we have our bending moment we bending moment functions we can now go on to calculate our deflection so our deflection And down to B and this is in the primary structure this will be equal to the integral between naught and L of little m of X cap multiplied by capital M of X divided by E I and all integrated over dx. In this case, we're gonna to have to split the integral between naught and three meters and three meters and eight meters because the bending moment functions change. So our total integral between naught and L is an integral between naught and three which is 0.625x multiplied by 8 minus x multiplied by our w upon 2 which is 16.2 and then we need to divide out by the EI value which was 26,700 and integral over dx but just to remind ourselves this bit here is m of x and this bit here is capital M x and we also need to do this for the portion of the beam between 3 meters and 8 meters 
So our little m of x was 0, 0.375 and then 8 minus x for this portion of the beam and then we calculate by our capital M of x which is our w upon 2, 16.2 and we add x into 8 minus x all divided by the EI value which was 26,700 and we crunch this through put a couple of dot dot dots and you'll get that your deflection in the primary structure at B is equal to 60 millimeters. So now we know the deflection that exists in the primary structure, but we wish to get this back to zero by calculating a multiplier times a flexibility coefficient, and the multiplier being our real reaction. So first of all, we need to calculate the flexibility coefficient. So the flexibility coefficient at B from a unit load at B is equal to the integral between node and L of M of X multiplied by little M of X divided by EI all integrated over DX and again Doing the multiplications, carrying out the integrals, we get that our flexibility coefficient is equal to 3.51 times 10 to the minus 4 meters per kilonewton. So with our flexibility coefficient calculated, our fictitious displacement in the primary structure calculated, we can now define our compatibility equation. So if we have the displacement in the primary structure plus the flexibility coefficient, this is how much displacement you would get for one a unit force multiplied by what force we would need, what the reaction force is, and we know that eventually we should get a displacement of zero. And we can rearrange this if we like. Then the R B Y equals minus delta B upon the flexibility coefficient F B B and we already have these values, we have minus 0 0.06 and that's in meters divided by the flexibility coefficient which was 3.51 times 10 to the minus 4 meters per kilonewton and finally we get that our reaction equals minus 171 kilonewtons and so that is just doing the pure calculations and we get a negative sign out but that negative sign came about because we applied the unit load in a downwards direction whereas we whereas actually what we need is an RBY which goes in the opposite direction ie upwards so the value for RBY is 171 kilonewtons pointing in upwards direction. So with our redundant reaction now calculated, we can use this to determine the other reaction forces and then go on to draw our bending moment and shear force diagrams. So the reactions of the real structure. So we've calculated reactions of the primary structure, we've calculated the reactions of the redundant structure where we applied a unit load, and eventually we got RBY. 
but that RBY will not be in equilibrium with the reactions in the primary structure. So we need to return to our original structure. And now we're going to calculate our AY. We have our BY, and we know that this is 171 kilonewtons. We've already calculated that. We have an unknown RCY, and we have a uniformly distributed load across the entire structure, which was 32.4 kilonewtons per meter along the beam. So, again, let's use some equations of equilibrium and calculate RAY and RCY. So, first of all, I'm going to take, so this is A, B, C. I'm going to take moments about A, and from taking moments about where A, I calculate that RCY equals 65.5 kilonewtons, and that will be pointing upwards. And if I take the sum of the forces in the Y direction, I will get that RAY is equal to 22.7 kilonewtons also pointing upwards. So now that I know my reaction forces, I can go on to draw my shear force diagram. So let's just draw structure and let's have gray. So his A, his B, and his C, and that's V shear force in. Kilonewtons. So the first thing that I have is a reaction at A and it's 22.7 kilonewtons upwards. And then I have a UDL applied for 3 meters. The UDL applied for, and that was 32.4 kilonewtons per meter. Multiplied by 3 meters is 120 something. So 22.7 minus 120 and a bit takes me down to a value of 74.5 kilonewtons. And at point B, I apply the 171 kilonewton reaction, taking me to 96.5. And then I have five meters of 32.4 kil kilonewtons per meter. So five times 32.4 is 150, 160, 162, ish, 161. And so this takes me down to a value of 65.5. And so here is my shear force diagram. Also useful to calculate, I'm not going to show the calculation, this is just revision from statics, is this distance to where the shear force goes through zero, and therefore the bending moment will be a maximum or a minimum. So this would be at 0 0.7 meters. And this distance here, is 2.02 meters from the right hand side of the beam. Finally, we're going to draw the bending moment diagram. I'm going to use those values for where the shear force went through zero to help us draw this diagram. So, the bending moment diagram. So, 
to help us calculate this, we could write a function, put it into a graph plotting package, maybe a spreadsheet package and do that. What we're going to do in this case is actually calculate some key values and use the fact that we know that we have with UDL parabolic distributions of the loading. So first of all, let's remind ourselves the situation. We have a bit of the beam, make a cut. We get R, A, Y. We have a UDL, which would be 32.4 kilonewtons per meter. And our bending moment function, M of X. And from this, we can calculate the moment at B. So we have, so this moment at B is equal to R A Y multiplied by the three meters, the distance to B minus 32.4, the loading multiplied by three meters so we get the total load on the section towards b multiplied by the lever arm of 1.5 meters just remind ourselves that ray was actually 22.7 kilonewtons and this gets us that the moment at b is minus 77.7 .7 kilonewton meters and we in Looking at the shear force diagram, we found out that the bending moment went through zero at 0.7 meters. So for our bending moment diagram, we'd like to know what that maxima or minima bending moment was. And so we can insert 0 0.7 into our bending moment equation and calculate that that bending moment at 0 0.7 meters is equal to 7.95 kilonewton meters and on the right hand side of the beam drawing a free body diagram making a cut we have m of x r a y r b y and the UDL over the entire section, and we can write a bending moment function. But what we'd really like to know is where the bending moment was a maximum, so 2.02 .02 meters from the right hand side. So as we're going from the right hand side, it's actually easier if we draw a free body diagram from the right hand side, make our cut and put our bending moment in a clockwise direction and we have our UDL which was 32.4 and our reaction RCY and a coordinate of X dash and we want to know where X, when X dash is 2.02 .02, what is the moment? So when x dash equals 2.02 .02 meters, and after right now, bending moment function substituting for 2.02 .02 meters, we get that that value is at 66.1 kilonewton meters. And with these values, now we can go and draw our bending moment diagram. So let's. Let's draw some lines. So we've got A, we've got B, and we've got C. And let's draw those known values on our bend moment diagram. And I'm going to draw on the tension side of the beam. So for in a beam situation, if this is M, but my positive axis is pointed downwards, it means that our bending moment diagram drawn on the tension side, we know it's zero here, zero at C. We know at the short distance in, we had a minima or maximum of 7.95. 
on this right hand side 2.02 meters in so two fifths of the way in so around about here we had a value of 66.1 kilonewton meters and at the reaction we had 77 and drawing now got some dotted lines and then some approximate quadratic shapes between them we can get this as our bending moment diagram so finally having calculated our loading from first principles using even the the mass densities of the materials we calculated our second moment of area values from first principles and using the virtual work or unit load method we've managed to calculate our shear force and bending moment diagram